Eric Hansen has seated time. Ashley is a small hammer. Has seated time. Um, looks like tennis. Tennessee. Cass Tennessee. Okay, thanks. Uh, Kathy uh, Mendoza. No, uh, she's speaking on her own. Oh, she is? Yes. Okay. And uh, Janine Spatella. Uh, is it Rancine Lydell? Rishan Lydell. Okay, mm -hmm. Rishan Lydell. Uh, and so you have a, you have, have a potential of about 20 minutes here. Uh, you don't need to go that long. It's, <laughs> it's, it's your call. Uh, I think I only need about 15 minutes. I'll try to wrap it up a little bit shorter than that if we can. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Marty and uh, Councilmember Cole. You've been instrumental in obviously getting us here. Thank you very much. Councilmember Katie, it was a pleasure to meet with you. You, just, uh, you opened the door as far as meeting with the council members. So, so um, thank you for that. Um, and I want to thank all of the uh, activists that are here because I know you had to work. And I know that uh, being here at 2 o'clock or something like that might be dealing with your jobs, but thank you for coming. <laughs> well, we know right now that there's a national movement. Um, the issues that came out of Ferguson, the issues that came out of uh, New York City, um, all of these were issues that uh, brought to light some very disturbing things that we pretty much already knew what was going to happen. Um, out of that came a national list of demands. These demands were given to President Barack Obama. Um, they were given to uh, governments pretty much all over uh, the United States. Um, we took those demands and took the, the things that uh, pretty much pertain to us here locally. So this is not just something that, was, that just came out of the blue. Um, but even if it did, it would be the needs of our community. But um, I just want to I make sure that people understand that we are in line with that national movement. And I've, I, re I realize that there's no greater time than now to discuss these things and to make them my priority. Um, I've been able to meet with uh, our council members, uh, a few of our council members, and uh, Chief Zimmerman. And uh, it's, it's encouraging to see at least the, the, the dialogue is starting to happen. Um, uh, we really wanted to respond uh, to the responses that you, you uh, issued on Chief Um And thank you one, once and uh, foremost for doing that. I just want to let it be known first and foremost. Thank you for the work that you're doing in the community. I see a considerable effort to reach out to the community. I see a considerable effort to, at, at the very least, try and work with us. Um, and I, I think the things that we're going to mention today um, well, we've had this discussion, so it's really nothing new that we already discussed in, in that meeting. Um, but uh, I want to go point by point uh, as of uh, the demand, uh, your response to our demands. The special prosecutor, you pretty much told us that we need to speak to the city attorney, um, uh, those things, and, and that's understandable. We are officially requesting a meeting to sit down with the city attorney and discuss that, those things with him. Um, uh, so we'll go ahead and just move on to the next thing. Police held accountable for use of deadly force. We believe that officers should be accountable for the use of deadly force in every encounter. Um, the, there was a bunch of documents that were sent along with the responses. Um, we obviously don't have time to go through all those. But um, uh, one of the biggest things that you point brought up were that the, um, the, US, the United States Supreme Court rule that there would be a 72 hour period for use of force, uh, uh, that all officer shootings, uh, involved in shootings within 72 hours of the incident. Um, we requested 48, 72 is acceptable. Uh, so that was our reply as far as that is concerned. Um, we did want to make the process clear to the community though. We also believe as far as uh, training and things of that nature, um, we did mention the policies and, and what's already instituted and how, uh, how the use of force is used as far as, and gave us a bunch of policy on that. And my, our biggest thing with that is that the community is unaware of these things. They may exist within the police force itself and the officers, whether they understand it or not, you know, that remains to be seen. Um, but I know for sure our, our community does not have a full understanding of that. So if Joe Blow is, a, you know, he's, uh, I don't know, mouthing off at, at an officer, does that warrant a baton? Does that warrant a taser if that officer gets angry or upset? These are the type of things that I think if we have uh, uh, further dialogue actually sitting in highly meetings on use of force. So not only that, you know what to expect, that we know what to expect. 
and that if we it's kind of like knowing your rights. When we know our rights, it's kind of hard for people to like abuse them. Um, so when it comes to these use of force things, it's not just a matter that the policy exists. We need to understand the policy in a Barney style presentation. What is it that you are allowed to use your use of force for? That is kind of where we're going with the uh, the use of force, um, as far as that's concerned. Uh, uh, demand number C, representative police force and intentional officer training. We believe that a police force should be representative of the, those citizens that is designed to serve and protect. Um, we know that there are other issues when it comes to recruitment. And one of the biggest things I think, uh, one, I understand we, we have a very small African American community uh, here in San Diego, about 3 million people, I believe it's 168,000. Uh, so one, that just makes it hard. Uh, but uh, one of the things that may also be a problem are things that may have been uh, uh, misdemeanors and things like that that may stop uh, African Americans from applying or other things that happened years ago uh, that may stop African Americans from applying for a police force that they may want to join to make it more representative, but they can't join because of things that happened in their past. I don't know what needs to happen to make that process easier, but dialogue should be started as far as that is concerned as well. Um, if we do truly want a representative force, um, and, and this goes to a lot bigger issues of mass incarceration and things like that that we do not have time to discuss, but um, African Americans uh, are getting uh, misdemeanors and other things pulled over and getting records. Um, and it, in a lot of ways, it stops them from potentially applying for a police force that they may want to join um, and may actually help to uh, have more African Americans on the force. So these things need to be looked at um, and given serious consideration as far as um, representation. Um, and you also mentioned the cultural competency training and we did talk about that. Uh, you, uh, I'll read your uh, response directly so I don't mess it up. Uh, the SDPD is mandated by California Post to conduct 24 hours of academy training covering cultural awareness, diversity, and discrimination. San Diego PD provides 47 hours of academy training. SDPD also provides seven hours of training for these subjects. And the rest, so you can kind of just, it, you all have these documents, so if you'd like to look at them, you may. Um, and here's our response to that. It's incumbent upon the entire community that the cultural awareness training that exists is obviously not enough. At this point, um, if uh, the data that we were able to view in a meeting from ACLU, because PERF is obviously still not out, um, uh, still shows that there is racial profiling. And I know you have a, a, a no tolerance uh, against, uh, for racial profiling, so I, I know where you stand on it. Um, but if any of the issues uh, that are coming up, like Sergeant Scott uh, can show us, that you may not know everything that's going on in your police department, or it's not being reported, um, we, we know of the code of silence. Um, and we know that officers want to support one another. And I understand that, I'm a United States Marine. I had a code of silence as well. But there's one thing that that code of silence did not stand above, and that was my ethics and our morals. And uh, so when things uh, may be reported or, or brought to the attention, it's, um, it's, it's one of those things where you, these things may not be reported to the higher ups. Um, and if stuff is going on in the streets or things that need to be reported and they're not, then that's a problem and you may not see everything. Um, it's, it's an issue for us um, that lieutenants, and I'll just go back to issues that were before your, uh, your uh, chief of and the sexual assault issues. Uh, now we do have the cases uh, coming um, out from Sergeant Scott with the, uh, the, the training things um, uh, uh, the, the, the picture that was shown, and although we don't have all the details, it just, it paints a picture for us that there is a problem. Um, I, I, I'd love to ignore it, uh, but it's right there in our face. Um, so uh, obviously you inherited some of these things, uh, but there is, a, there is a problem in the San Diego Police Department with uh, institutional racism. Um, the mural that is in the Southeast District where they didn't want to say there's too many black faces. I don't understand what that means. So um, again, these are other people, other officers who uh, didn't want to show their faces for fear of retribution. 
So uh, I, I love, I, I understand when you say that there, there needs to be a full investigation. Um, but in a lot of times, uh, the, I, I, I consider it the same thing as a victim blaming thing. Uh, when somebody comes forth with something, an officer comes forth, just like when a woman may come forth for rape and she's automatically, well, what have you done to cause that? And um, although the investigation still has to be completed, those complaints need to be taken very seriously. I know that you, we've spoken, you said that you are, and I, I believe you 100%, but they just don't, they, they not only need to be taken very seriously from you, they need to be taken seriously from the lieutenants, from the sergeants, all the way down the chain of command. So that this, this things, by the time it gets to you, they, it's already happened. And a lot of the measures that we're implementing right now are defensive measures. Uh, after the fact. Our civilian review board is after the fact. God forbid we have a Ferguson type incident here and then the civilian review board has to say something about it. Um, uh, I'll get to that later. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Um, but uh, we, this, this code of silence, it is an issue. Um, uh, the training and cultural sensitivity uh, awareness, it is an issue. It's not something that can, can wait until uh, three, six, seven months down the road, it has to be handled now. In my opinion, what is the harm in adding more hours to understanding African American culture? City Heights is abundant with all sorts of uh, ethnic, ethnicity, ethnic, ethnic races and things of that nature. So these things don't harm us to add more hours to that. I understand what what is mandated. And, and, you know, uh, and I understand that some of these things cost dollars. Um, but at, in the same light, if it's going to, in the future, protect lives, protect uh, people from getting uh, killed, um, then, then we need to address it now. Um, I already mentioned that. So, Demand D, Comprehensive Review of Systemic Abuses by Local Police Depart Departments. We believe that there is a systemic and structural racism present in police practices nationwide. And that these practices undermine the foundation of democracy. So uh, some of these demands kind of go hand in hand and they seem like they're repeating themselves, but they're not. Um, the nationwide uh, movement that's going on has brought to light a lot of the institutional racism that is just seems to be inherent in a lot of our police departments. You see the issue in uh, Florida where the guys were shooting um, <laughs> pictures of African Americans. Thank God nothing like that's happening here. But we do just have a glimpse if, uh, I, I can only imagine the things that aren't being reported. Uh, Sergeant Scott had to go to the length of a, a lawsuit to get some type of attention. And so what that means for me is that lawsuit just represents the fact that something something has already been in there. It's not just one person reporting. There's probably a bunch of other African American officers that have seen this and just, oh, they're scared as well. So these these issues of institutional racism that have uh, permeated our police department, we, we have to deal with those now. Um, and we there has to be more attention paid to these now and not just dismissed as if, well, it's us uh, pulling a race car because it's more than that. These are real grievances. And again, uh, when it goes to the victim blame, we need to be taken just as seriously as the officer who's saying he didn't do it. Um, so uh, that's important to us. Now we asked for a comprehensive review by the Council of Abuses by local police department uh, for this committee and hopefully for the city council. We have our own local issues. Uh, case in point, Victor Ortega. I, I believe I said his name right, right? Victor Ortega uh, shot while he was in police custody, uh, handcuffed. And this happened years ago. And still no justice for a, a killing of an unarmed man who was handcuffed. Now, these are the type of things that our community, it, it really garners this, this issue of distrust. This is why we don't trust. You can go into the community as much as you want and have the best intentions, but until we get justice, all of this is really, it's, it's kind of just waiting for another incident. Until the mindsets of officers go back to peace, uh, the protectors of the peace instead of um, uh, really enforcers of it, um, 
then we will, these issues will continue to come up. Um, there's many more names uh, uh, that are, that have uh, just injustices and things like that have happened uh, in the last uh, years that really nothing has been done. So when you look at these things, we have to, we can't just continuously dismiss them. I'll keep saying that, we can't, we cannot continuously dismiss them as if there is no problem here in this community. Um, San Diego has our own uh, our own issues just as much as the rest of the nation. Uh, the, de the, the development of a use of force standards in the company, I already spoke on that, and the comprehensive local review of police department's data collection. It seems like we've been waiting forever for PERF to come out. I don't know what's, uh, what's taking so long with this, but there has been some data that's come out. Um, I, I, I personally attended a, an AFIO meeting where some of this data was shown. And let me see if I can say this correctly where everybody understands. Uh, just for s stops and searches alone, granted there were more stops of whites. There were more whites in the San Diego uh, community. Um, but there were more, there was less stops of blacks, but more searches for the smaller number of blacks that were stopped. Less contraband was found on those smaller number of blacks that were stopped. Less whites were stopped, I mean more whites were stopped, less were searched, but more contraband was found on the less, on the less whites that were searched. So you still see an issue of racial profiling, and it's not, and the data even shows that it's not even warranted. So the, most of the areas where you found contraband were in La Jolla and Del Mar. Um, well, <laughs> It, it, it's not to be funny. That's just where money's at. And so, um, it, it, what what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is that there is still a racial profiling issue going on. And I know the work that the San Diego uh, Police Department has been doing, and uh, as as far as trying to try and root that out. And I know your convictions towards it, um, uh, but it is still an issue um, in this community, and we're very, very, very much concerned about it. Um, so. Uh, summons and searches, I just spoke on that. <clears throat> Demand number E, end over police and abusive use of force. I, I have to spend most of the time here because uh, I understand that, uh, at least things take time, and, and I understand that. But we, as a community, we have something in place that is supposed to protect us, and that is our civilian review board our community review board, whatever you would like to call it. It's our foot in the door, so to speak. Um, many, many members of this community find that board to be ineffective. I, um, can I see that document right there, um, Kathleen? Um, you all have this, and this is from your own website, uh, where it shows uh, the numbers uh, for different uh, reviews and things that were uh, reported. Um, 167 uh, total allegations. And if you look at the unfounded category, um, out of the 34 uh, courtesy uh, things, the 20 were unfounded. Out of the conduct, five unfounded, and there was only five allegations. Out of the criminal conduct, uh, total number of allegations, there's five and there's only there's three unfounded. Out of discrimination, there's 11 total allegations and 10 unfounded. Um, out of the force, uh, 14 unfounded, two not sustained, uh, 10 exonerated. I could go on, I mean, the numbers are there, but what it paints is the 72% uh, figures that we're getting that, 72% um, of the time, uh, uh, the board, sides on the side of the police. Um, well, again, it goes to this automatic trust of police officers over members of the community. Um, we're all human, we all have the ability to lie. Those numbers, honestly, to me, should be about a 50-50. Uh, not one, what, not one, what, not one um, percentage higher than the other. Um, so when you, when you look at these numbers, it's, it, it kind of shows you why we don't trust that this board is working in our favor in the first place. Um, uh, and just some of the things, um, does that yellow light mean my time's almost up? Mm -hmm. How much more time do I have? You have 53 seconds. Oh. 
We would like to prioritize the community, the civilian review board, as our me our main means of meeting these demands. Not to say that the rest are not important. We would like to officially request a, a meeting with the mayor's office because we understand he has the power. But if in time that community that mayor does not agree to the things, we know that a charter review is coming up, and we would like this council to change measures on the on the charter itself so that we can get more representation from the community, not mayor appointed. We want our representation from the community. We want to elect those members. The community, the Civilian Review Board is our highest priority right now, and it needs to be overhauled. She said uh, they need a budget. They need, um, uh, we need diversity on that board. And uh, we need to make this a priority so that we feel like we have some type of protection when it comes to our public force. Thank you very much. Kathy Mendoza, you have three minutes, ma'am. Thank you for being here. Okay, so as I echo uh, Marty Emerald's stepping on toes, um, I'm going to be talking about a very touchy situation regarding uh, the number of outcomes of use of force and officer-involved shootings that reflect the quarterly report um, that Mark Jones was talking about. Uh, so this is April, May, June 2014. As Mark was saying, out of 167 incidents, there were only 23% of them reviewed by the CRB. Significantly higher, 90 cases are unfounded. They are put into different categories, use of force, officer-involved police shooting, slur, service, arrest, courtesy, conduct, criminal conduct, and discrimination. I just want to highlight two categories, and that's the use of force. 14 cases were unfounded, 10 of them were exonerated, and four of them not sustained. Now this is a use of force. Officer-involved shootings, I mean, it's, it's devastating. For the officer-involved shootings, it shows only six cases were reviewed, and all six cases were within policy. So my question is, for individuals, community members, and the San Diego Police Department present, when is it policy for them to use that excessive force when they have other means to restraint, other means that they're trained for, for non-lethal, approaches to use of force. As I hold this card up, now Mark mentioned this individual's name. His name is Victor Ortega. In June 2012, he was murdered, as Mark was saying, cuffed. He was on his, on his stomach. And when the widow filed a complaint, the DA, as well as all the other avenues that she took said it was justified. Recently, a judge ruled that there were inconsistencies in the case in the DA's information as well as the cops. This is the reason why we need something independent with subpoena power that is away from the San Diego Police Department. They cannot investigate themselves. On these yellow cards, there are 125 victims murdered by San Diego Police Department, which could have been prevented. They could have been here today. They could have voiced their concerns. They could have had lives. They could have had families. These were family members. And if there's other avenues that police department, that the police can take to do their community policing without taking a life, that's the most important. SD Stolen Lives. Thank you very much. Valerie San Felipe. Oh, no. No? Oh. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Ms. Felipe, you've got three minutes. Thank okay, you. I'll just mention a few things. Um, number one, Chief Zimmerman, you say you're going to use cameras, but you're not releasing the tape to the public. Then you might as well not have cameras. You have to be able to see that. Um, from personal experience, police reports are extremely false. 
and they're allowed to lie. I don't know how many times I've heard, you know, reaching for, for a weapon, that nobody does that. Um, I understand there's a case of a teacher who was arrested for pulling over in the wrong area, and I hope that he can be freed. Your, your um, program of lemon drop, I, I object to that. That is like San Diego stop and frisk. You're um, persecuting people who are being released from prison. And they're just trying to get themselves together. They, they should, they, you have no warrant to stop them on the trolley. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, final public speaker, uh, Pastor Richard Cisco. God bless you, Mark. It's good to see you good. Thank you. Uh, running. Thank Praise you. God. My name, my name is Pastor Richard Cisco. Excuse me, all right? I'm kind of a little nervous by that in my pants. Uh, I pastor in City Heights. I pastor in the hood, all right? I work, I specialize in gangs, all right? And uh, I get tired of, I get tired about this black and white thing. I get tired about this PD and uh -huh. community thing. You know, let's keep it real. I'm talking, you know, I, I work with the Skyline Bloods. I, I, was at, I was at Jacob Center the other day, and I was talking about this kid, uh, leader from the, from the Bloods, and little did I know, he was there. He was, hey, Rich, it's me. All right, he stood up. He's working as a counselor in Escondido. I praise God he made it. I work with the West Coast Crips, Neighborhood Crips, uh, Lincoln Park, uh, Lincoln Park Bloods, uh, Five Nine Brims. I work with the Asian Gangs. And last but not least, as a pastor, uh, God has brought me working with San Diego PD, straight up. San Diego PD, and uh, you know, I came in today, and one of the officers says, Cisco, could you talk into the microphone, please? So well, I'll praise God, I'm right against this, yeah. all right? <laughs> but anyway, you know, uh, uh, five, uh, uh, when I got released, the Lord put in my heart, uh, do something, bring the whole neighborhood together. You know, it's not black and white, it's not uh, green or whatever. We're one, we're one society, we're one people under God. This is one nation under God. What happened in Ferguson is sad. It doesn't give us the right to go up there and tear up our own city, our own town, burn our, burn our own, own uh, stores, everything. We show the whole world who we really are. And, and, and the grandmas and the grandpas are left to pick it up. You know, I, I looked at that and I said, oh, Lord, this is not you. It took a life of its own. You know, uh, I started working with PD. I'm very thankful that they opened up the doors for me. Uh, and and uh, I do the gospel fest at, right here in City Heights. And I said, Lord, why City Heights? We bring the whole hood together. The Mexican Mafia, gangs, Asians, all of them, and with PD. Because that's how society is. We're one unit, we're one people. And for five years, I've been doing it there. I remember the Mexican Mafia because I was locked up and I used to run with them guys. And I came, hey, man, I, you know what? I used to run and run with these guys. They called me the next day. Hey, Cisco, we like what you're doing. But you, they were trying to keep it politically correct. They said, you used to affiliate with us. I said, well, yeah. He goes, hey, why don't you guys come back to the meeting? But I thank God because I came to the PD. They opened up the doors. And you know, like I tell you, it's not about black and brown or anything. They came up, this guy, McKinney, gave, gave me a shot. Here he's picking up a kid at the gospel fest. And we should be not fighting against each other. You know, hey, sad to say that what happened in Ferguson, that's sad. As pastor, I look at it. Here I got a I got a white a white captain and a black captain working with a hood. They said uh, a picture spot, uh, what speaks a thousand words something like that. All right, my my job ain't to get up there getting bickering over and all that. It took me a while to work with PD. They were stopping me every day. What I'm going to do? Shout, scream, cuss them out. Eventually, one of the officers uh, he was in Iraq. He sat me down. He, he talked to me, working with me, because my mind was twisted. I'm from the hood. I used to be against PD. Now I pray for them. God ordained that. And we'll wrap it up. All right. And, and last but not least, I just want to say one more thing. You know, yeah. I thank God. I thank God for the chief. I thank God for all the officers because they come to the hood. And I, I, I give them hands on. We pray for the chief. Me and the pastor. I just want to share with you guys, all right? We need to come together. Forgive one another, all right? Not, not lambast at one another. Not lambast at them. Because when they come to the hood, when they come to the hood and they break into your house, all right? They steal your bike, they break in, your grandmother's there. Who are you going to call? 
God is a God of order. He ordained that. Granted, we're not perfect, but, but there's, there's a rule of law. We need to follow it. I thank God I've been with him for five years. Thanks, five years at Lowriders and, and the gang members. Thank and you thanks very for much. everything you do. <laughs> Praise God. And also, I specialize in games. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so very much. I'll turn it back to uh, Council Member Cole. You're having church for a while. I'm That's right. Okay. Uh, this, this is uh, a couple of questions about Team Chief. Um, again, thank everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, and Chief, thank you for being here also today. Just a question, uh, two questions. How do, how do Citizens Review Board recommendations weigh into the disciplinary decisions that you make when there is misconduct of a police officer? You know, this, the uh, Independent Review Board on uh, Citizens Review on Police Practices. You have your microphone on. <coughs> The Independent Review Board on Police Practices, uh, Citizen Review Board on Police Practices, that is an independent body. Um, is, uh, I think the director, um, Darnell Scarborough, is here, and, and I'd like to have her answer the question as, as the director of the board. Perfect. I turned in a slip to speak and wasn't called. Um, I didn't see it, Martha. Uh, uh, we'll let Danielle uh, Scarborough uh, make her comments and look to see if there's a slip. We didn't, we didn't see one. Go ahead, Danielle. Thank you, um, Council Members. I'm answering the question about the, um, if there is discipline as a result of a complaint of misconduct. So the Citizens Review Board would, if there is a sustained allegation, then the administration of discipline would come back to the board for review. So the, um, the determination and the administration is done by the command staff, and then the result comes back to the board. The team will pull out the case, of which that originally, um, the sustained finding was a part of, and then determine whether they feel like that was the legitimate um, discipline that was meted due to the, the complaint. There is a discipline matrix that we follow. The board uses that as well as the police department. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I believe I, I do understand that. And, um, but I still feel that we need to give uh, the review board more teeth and hopefully this executive director that's coming on board, we can talk with her to see how we can give this review board um, Chief, are you currently making an improvement to the cultural uh, sensitivity training that is being administered right now? Yeah, you know, I appreciate that uh, that question very much. And you know, my opening comments, I had talked about that police community relations. It, you know, it's not just a one-time meeting or a one-time class or a one-time project. It must be on the forefront, 724. But let me talk about what we're currently doing. Uh, regarding our advanced officer training. What that is, it's a 40-hour class that all officers must take. And uh, it started this month uh, in January, and the main component, which is woven throughout the 40-hour class, the entire training, is to understand, to have this discussion and understand, to the best of all of our abilities, how biases can be formed, both in a police department and in a community, and what we must do to prevent those biases. About 40% of this classroom discussion uh, revolving, uh, that revolves around the topic of human behavior, uh, emotions, and liability. The remaining 60% will include incorporating hands-on and scenario-based applications through role play and other activities. To get into some of the, the very specifics of what we're talking about here, these topics, some of them include, and there's others, but some of them include a topic of, I have the authority to do something, but is it the right thing to do? Being fair and impartial, diversity and non-bias based treatment in all of our actions, the goal of obtaining voluntary compliance, and how do we get there to get voluntary compliance? How verbal and non-verbal communication impacts those who we contact, and recognizing this is very important, I want to make sure everybody understands this, and that recognizing everyone, both the police officer and a community member, that each, everybody, an individual, has hot button topics and how to mitigate and avoid 
those hot button issues. We also look at de-escalation techniques, which are um, emphasized throughout the entire training during the different aspects of this 40-hour training. And as we talk about de-escalation, we talk about, again, uh, the body cameras. And we've had uh, uh, spoken to many of our officers already wearing body cameras, and I do want to talk about that. Um, we are a leader in this. We are the eighth largest city in the United States, and currently, if you take one through seven combined, we have more body-worn cameras right now at 600 on our officers wearing them than any of the other cities combined. Now, once they start to deploy them, of course, you know, they'll, they'll overtake us, but currently right now, our, our policy has gone throughout the United States and other countries. They have asked for it. It's a very comprehensive policy, but, but very important about that policy, too, is to have the ability, which we do, but every so often, every six months or so, to take a look at that policy to see do we need to, in some way, shape, or form, um, take a look at it to see if something needs to be changed uh, to make sure that it is the best practices out there. But uh, the feedback that I'm getting from the officers, from the uh, cameras, is basically this statement. There has been zero instances where they wish that they didn't have it. And there's been countless that they were grateful that they did have the camera. And it has de-escalated. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and lastly, I, I just want to say to everyone, this is the start of dialogue. This is the start. This is not the end. This is the start. We're going to continue to dialogue because that's the only way that we can be transparent and solve these issues. So I thank again everyone for being here. I thank uh, everyone for the respect that you show this committee, the chief. And now, I, and Chief, again, thank you so much for being here now. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Cave, would you mind if we have one more public speaker before you uh, ask your questions? Martha Sullivan? Bring it home, Martha. Thank you. you. I, I appreciate this. I don't know what happened, but my slip didn't get, uh, didn't reach where it was supposed to reach, apparently. Anyway, I'm here, um, Martha Sullivan, I'm here representing Women Occupy San Diego, as I have done on this issue over the last uh, year that we've been working on this. I'm really glad that this committee is taking up uh, this issue and taking up the, the demands that have been presented by the Black Student Justice Coalition. The Independent Civilian Review Board is absolutely essential to moving the city forward in the 21st century. It, it must be apparent that you cannot have true accountability and true transparency from an agency that investigates itself. That's got to be absolutely logical and apparent. And it, it's extremely, extremely timely and very, um, well, very good timing that we now uh, have a charter review committee started up and we will be able to pursue changes to the charter to make the civilian review board on police practices an independent body that will provide the accountability and the transparency that has been absent thus far. We've got 25 years under the current model and here we are. It's time to, to evolve, and it's time to join the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. King? Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Councilman uh, Cole, for, for bringing this on forward and pushing this forward, and thank you to Chief Silverman and Mr. Jones for, for coming as well, too, and, and thank you for meeting with me as well and uh, providing some insight. I really, really do appreciate that. Uh, Councilman Cole took one of my uh, questions, but uh, from the, the from your comments, uh, Mr. Jones, and and I agree with this, is that a lot of the, the issue sort of rises around engagement and hearing back and uh, what we are trying to do as council members and as a city to provide information to members of the public. And it's something that I think all of us council members challenge, are challenged with on a daily basis, how to rise uh, the level of engagement uh, between our city and, and members of the public. So um, one question I have for, uh, for you, Chief Silverman, is regarding um, different events that San Diego PD hosts on an annual basis to try to educate members of the public about 
job duties, what it takes, experiences, things like that. Can you talk more about the, the events that you do hold and, and how we can help as uh, council members and to, to help bring four members of the public to engage and, and participate in that and, or hold even more events? Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, question, Councilmember King. And as a matter of fact, um, I have personally invited Mr. Jones uh, to our next Inside the San Diego Police Department. And we invite anyone uh, to attend that. And uh, we hold that several times throughout the year. And it is our hope that we could actually expand upon that to be able to hold it more often. What that does is that it gives uh, the community member an opportunity to what we say is walk in a police officer's shoes for a few hours. Uh, we will give a... Um, There'll be some classroom and, and instruction and dialogue about use of force. Uh, some of the um, questions that Mr. Jones had brought up that we'll be able to more fully explain you know, in a lot more of um, you know, time. We don't have a lot of time here to do that, but we'll be able to uh, explain that a lot more. And then it's a lot of hands-on experiences where community members will have uh, the opportunity to be put in a scenario on uh, use of force and what they believe would be the appropriate use of force given the scenario. Uh, they'll also have an opportunity to, uh, to make what we call simulated traffic stops in real scenarios that police officers uh, go through. So there, it is held right up at the uh, training academy, exactly where police officers get trained. And uh, we welcome the community to come out. They're, they're usually between 80 and 100 community members every time we do this, three to four times a year. And we hope to expand that. Um, and, and something else, too, is what, what we plan to do. With this new um, class that we're talking about bias and, uh, and, and relations with, with the police department and overcoming um, the obstacles for that and making sure um, that uh, you know, we provide the, the best police services in a fair and impartial manner. What we plan to do later on, and uh, when I say later on, probably most likely sometime this summer, is to invite community members to this class. And we will also let the community members sit in this class and have these discussions, what our police officers are having these discussions. And I don't think that's ever been done before. So we're looking at new and innovative ways to continue to outreach with all of our communities. And we welcome all suggestions also. I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. It kind of leads into my next question. And when we spoke, uh, Chief Zimmerman, I, I laid out in my um, Priorities memo, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself uh, on the agenda, but one of the things that's often, often discussed is about the community policing <coughs> activities of the department pre-2006 to where we're at today with some of the cuts we have. And uh, I, I'll, only, I guess on the record on, on my request, I would love to, to hear those policies, those practices that have been unfortunately been cuts and the cost of those to re-implement those. And, whether that goes down to hiring more community relations officers or what have you to be out in the public um, that are representative, that speak various languages. You know, I represent a district that speaks many different languages from the API community. Um, so if that's something that we need to be, do, be had, I would love to see kind of a price tag placed on those about how we can fund additional programs that can go out and be, be responsive to the community, go out and be, be with the public uh, as much as possible throughout, throughout the year. Um, so I'd love to, to have that come back with, uh, with some ideas on that. And um, uh, lastly, I, I'm not sure, uh, Madam Chair, what your, what your ideas were in regarding the, the Citizen Review Board. Um, I know we have the new ED coming on. I know something we can have back maybe 45 to 60 days after, after their start um, to hear about their ideas, uh, opportunities for uh, reforms or changes or whatnot. It's just, um, have a first-time experience and, and from a fresh advice I would love to, to hear uh, from from her on, on what her ideas are um, and, and lastly on the Charter Review Committee uh, as vice chair of the Charter Review Committee I welcome the attendance at our, at our committee uh, and to hear additional ideas we're, we're just getting started on the committee so those ideas uh, I'm sure uh, Council President Leitner would love to, to have everyone attend and, and hear those ideas so um, with that I don't have any other other questions Thank you. So, Great discussion. Uh, you mentioned the inside the police department plans for summer programs where you invite the public in to, to, to get a first-hand look at the kind of training that <coughs> officers are getting. Um, but you do a lot more in the community as well. Could, would you like to elaborate more on what's happening in the community where we invite the public in uh, to be part of the process? Yeah, exactly. Is that, you know, we, 
people have heard us say this many times, is that we go to about 140 community meetings every single month. But that doesn't include um, street fairs or black parties or festivals. That, that That's all in addition to it. And we view each and every one of these as an opportunity um, to open up our police department in a problem-solving manner. Uh, Nextdoor.com, we took that from just a few thousand individuals. I believe we're up over about 50,000 households now that are engaging with their police department uh, and community members um, to ensure that we have the safest city in the United States. Uh, we are uh, using social media so much more now to try to get information out to the public about upcoming events, uh, such as uh, for the next six months, every Friday, uh, of the uh, last Friday of, of every month for the next six months, we're going to be holding a recruiting fair at the Malcolm X Library. Uh, we have several other community fairs that are coming up, also at the Jacob Center. And uh, you know we have new recruiting videos that are out there. Uh, we are reaching out to all communities, and we're looking, and, and we're so grateful uh, to Mayor Faulkner, to the City Council, for allowing us to hire 172 police officers this year. And I will tell you, we're getting, we're getting great recruits. We just need to keep them. I think as we all uh, have talked about that many, you know, many times. Um, and you talk about the um, the different aspects of, of being able to reach out more to the community. Uh, what we talk about all the time is community policing, and sometimes um, just getting out of the car and saying hello to somebody, uh, one minute at a time. And I'd like to say that we want to set the national model of police community relations right here in the city of San Diego. Let's show the entire nation on how this can be done. It would be nice to have numbers too, those numbers up so that officers will have time to be able to get out of their car, walk the beat, visit with the, the community, and uh, do that extra that extra legwork that is encompassed in Very the important. community police yes. process. Star Pal also reaching out to kids. Uh, yeah. That's a that's an important program as well, a part of your community outreach. You know, and it's true. And just this last Saturday, we held our indoor triathlon at the Lawrence Family um, Jewish Community Center, and uh, I, I'm so pleased to say that we doubled our efforts. Just we we, we raised close to twenty thousand dollars on Saturday, which was about double of what we've done before. And the money goes directly for our youth. Uh, we believe that we could bring our youth together with law enforcement today, it's only gonna build safer communities tomorrow. And there was many of the star pal kids that were there that were telling story upon story that if it wasn't for our star pal program, that they would have gotten involved in gangs, they would have gotten involved in drugs, and they're dreaming now of going to college. And uh, those are just success story upon success story, and that's just one of the the few events that we do, and, and we do reach out to the community in so many so many ways, but I think we all know that we can, need to continue to do more. And if uh, Pastor Cisco was up here at the mic again, he'd talk about the, the regular meetings in Mid-City right. uh, between the police department and uh, members of the community talking about the, the issues that have come up, the crime problems, the, the, you know, how do we resolve these, uh, these disputes within the community. Uh, is that happening at other precincts as well uh, around the city? Many of the uh, captains at each of the divisions, they have their uh, captain's advisory board, they have their problem solving meetings, and again, we go to community meetings and we view each one as an opportunity to engage the community, to work together to solve issues. And I know next month we'll be giving our crime stats, uh, and there's some, some very uh, successful results and programs that are going to show the results of, um, of uh, the crime stats that we're doing uh, next month. So hey, speaking of, of next month, the PERF report uh, that was referenced by Mr. Jones, the audit, uh, is that report also uh, due to be released next month? Yeah, I Just on uh, Monday, I had a uh, discussion. I, I spoke with the uh, PERF. Executive Director of Perth on just Monday, and I inquired as to what the status is of this report. And I was informed that the report is over at the Department of Justice for review. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll get that soon. I was not given a timeline on when that when I will actually receive that report. I, I have not received it yet, but it's over at the Department of Justice now for review. Which is a problem with audits. We can't uh, tell them what to say or when to say it. So yes. we just have to sit here and be patient and wait for that information to uh, to arrive here in San Diego. And then we'll we'll pick that apart and see where we can uh, improve or what we're doing right and uh, what uh, programs we can grow. And then you were speaking also about the, the inside of PD, that you have some uh, a, a first-hand look at what officers go through during the day. Does that include ride-alongs? If someone would like to go on a ride-along, they can contact the division that either they live in or work 
work uh, in, and uh, we can facilitate a ride along. And not that I want to drag this out because it's uh, late in the afternoon, but the, I wanted to uh, pick up on where uh, Council Member Cole left off. She said this discussion is just beginning, but it's more than just coming into this room and having uh, people speak in three minute increments. This is about getting out, putting on our shoes, and walking uh, in those footsteps that the police officers walk, or, or vice versa, walking in the footsteps of the community and, what, and experiencing what they experience day to day. And that's where we start, uh, we start understanding each other better, probably. Uh, and uh, so some of these community engagements uh, are open to the public. Anybody who wants to be part of the ride-alongs, the uh, inside the PD, the classes that you're looking at uh, creating, being part of uh, any of the uh, I the interaction programs you have in your precincts, or be volunteering for Star Pal and seeing how police and young people are interacting in the community, having real firsthand, hands-on knowledge about what's happening in the community, and then uh, creating some strategies or opinions based upon that firsthand information. Um, I, I would be curious to know how many people who, uh, and, and I'm not standing up for the, the Citizens Review Board, I've heard lots of complaints over the years as well, and, and I'm looking forward to some new energy, perhaps some new ideas coming in, uh, but how many people have actually attended these meetings, which are public? Uh, I, I think that we all have to go beyond just talking the talk, we all have to walk the walk and be actively engaged in the change that we want to see in our community. Uh, and and uh, so I look forward to having more discussions here at this committee, but hopefully between now and the next time we have this discussion, uh, more people uh, on both sides of the issue uh, are engaged in the community and uh, becoming witnesses to what's happening out there uh, and not just bringing anecdotal information. Um, and not that uh, these, these uh, these impressions are, anything's wrong with them necessarily because we all have impressions, but let's make sure that we're armed with the facts and we use those facts to find uh, real solutions to the problems that exist. So there, that's, I'm, I'm on my soapbox there and I'll get off of it. Anything else that either of you would like to add uh, before we wrap this up? No, thanks for the opportunity uh, to be here today. Oh, wonderful. And thank you for meeting with the community. Thank you to the community for being here. Thank you, Mr. Jones. You're an eloquent spokesman for this, uh, this, in, this engagement, and I really look forward to working with you uh, into the future to help create the kind of change that you want to see in the community and that we all want to see in the community. Thank you very much, and, and everybody with the coalition, thank you very much. Accept the invitations, okay? And uh, police work ain't bad either. So if you're, you're interested in law enforcement, and be part of that change firsthand. I'm sure that uh, our police chief and the command staff would uh, love to snag you and show you the ropes and uh, show you what a, a, a great career opportunity it is and how you can make a difference uh, in your lives uh, through this kind of a profession. So I appreciate you all. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We're going to go briefly to um, our final item, which is the wonderful memos that we received. And i got to tell you, I, I, I love the memos that have come in from members of this committee uh, but, and also from uh, others on the city council. Uh, public safety, quality, um, uh, neighborhoods, that's what it's all about. And, uh, and that's what we're getting from members of of the council, and I'd like uh, to offer uh, Ms. Cole, Mr. Kate, the opportunity to, to elaborate on some of the ideas that the, the initiative is going to bring to this committee. Go for it. So I, I can't do that offer. Uh, so, so thank you. I'm very proud to be selected to serve on the committee again. Here we tackle issues that are very important to my community and we'll see of body-worn cameras and updated findings of vehicle stop data cards. This year, I'd also like to discuss the Citizen Review Board, as we talked about, and re-evaluating the process in place for board member qualifications. I believe we can make serving on the board more attractive and easier to the good citizens of our respective communities. In addition, I'll continue to advocate for more diversity in our police department at every level of our police department. Our police department has a common goal. And as, as uh, Mark Jones stated, I like what he stated, they're here as protectors of the peace versus enforcers of the peace. I, I like that. 
because they are here to protect and serve our city. Hiring and promoting police officers with different black experiences will help the department reach that common goal. It will promote cultural sensitivity within the department and improve community relations in the city. I anticipate further discussion about how we can make this happen. Thank you again. I'm looking forward to a wonderful year. It's going to be uh, packed, too. <laughs> <laughs> We've got lots of priorities, lots of uh, great ideas and innovations. Mr. King? Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I too echo sentiments of Councilman Cole about the excitement to be on this committee. So uh, I look forward to your leadership, uh, Madam Chair, and, and setting the agenda. Maybe a difficult task ahead of you to do a lot of things uh, within just a year. Uh, I definitely look forward to rolling up the sleeves and, and getting to work. Um, just to kind of highlight a couple of things that uh, I mentioned previously with Chief Zimmerman about uh, community policing is obviously a, a big issue for me, especially for the diversity that I have in my district and wanting to make sure that we're out in the community and engaging as much as possible over the next year. Another thing too that I'm looking forward to trying to get off the ground, at least within my district and looking to other districts throughout the city on best practices, but with the neighborhood watch programs as a way to supplement uh, our police programs and get the community involved and engaged and, and get to know one each other, look out for one each other, uh, one another, and making sure that they have the resources that they need to, to do uh, what they can to, to protect them and to take care of their neighborhoods. And, and lastly, uh, just real quick um, about uh, homelessness issues. Uh, I, I know a lot of us had an opportunity to take part in the, in the point time counts um, uh, just last week, and, and I was able to, to stay in my district and get a different viewpoint on what homeless looks like up in, in, in my district. And one of the things that uh, I want to look forward to is, is discussing opportunities to partner with either the county or other, other folks to uh, address homelessness within canyons. It's uh, something that uh, our district is adjacent to many canyons that are, uh, are, tr are, ju are jewels to our community and treasure troves, and we want to make sure that folks can enjoy them, but also that folks who uh, uh, do uh, have a home set up, temporary home set up in those canyons, that they have the resources available to them to make sure that uh, they get the service they deserve. So um, uh, with Teclodi and uh, Los Pansquitos, those are great, great canyon uh, preserves. I want to make sure that our goal we can to, to take care of those and while also getting services folks to, to who need them. So, uh, we're going to be exploring some of those ideas over the next year as well, too, to figure out what we can do to, uh, to make that a reality. So thank you very much. I'm definitely looking forward to working with everybody to do some great things for the city. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, this is uh, part of the discussion uh, agenda. If anybody would like to move that we accept these uh, these memos. Uh, so moved. I second. All right. And those in favor? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. And with that, we uh, adjourn this meeting of PS and LN to February 25th at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you.